Welcome to discuss biodiversity. It's a word we hear all the time these days, but what exactly does it mean and how is it related to our pursuit of sustainability? And could it someday be a global shared value so that we all wanted to preserve and enhance biodiversity? Today, we'll find out. We have a group of distinguished panelists on board and first we'll hear their replies to some tough questions and then we'll proceed on the basis of chat questions and comments. So please go ahead and write in the chat. First, I would like to welcome Ilari Saksjärvi, who is Professor of Bi uh, Biodiversity Research and Director of the Biodiversity Unit at University of Tor. We have agreed to address each other on a first name basis, or actually I have agreed all by myself, but I hope it's okay with you. So uh, Ilari, can you please help us define biodiversity? Uh, what exactly are we talking about? And what do we know about it? Yes. Definitely. And good afternoon, everybody. And, and Maya Rita, thank you very much for the invitation to, to join this seminar. I'm very happy to be here. The topic is extremely important. And, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with Ilkka, Markus and, and Anni to, and you to talk about it. Well, let's start with the, with the definition of biodiversity. Uh, it was actually as a concept, it was introduced to the world quite, quite a long time ago in the 1980s in the, in the National Science Forum in the United States. Uh, before of, of the term uh, biodiversity, researchers talked about biological diversity, which is a kind of longer version of biodiversity. So biodiversity is a bit uh, easier to, to remember. It's a shorter, shorter uh, concept. Uh, traditionally, we have uh, divided uh, biodiversity into different key elements or levels. So we can talk about genetic biodiversity or genetic diversity, a species diversity, and then ecological diversity. And genetic diversity refers to all the variety of, of nucleotides and genes and chromosomes and, and genetic variation between the species and within the populations of the same species. And then the species diversity refers to all the species that we have discovered and, and described during the, the last uh, centuries. And we can also study uh, species diversity at different levels. So we can study, for example, uh, species diversity or species richness at local scale, or we can, we can uh, try to estimate, for example, the global species richness. And then uh, on the third floor, we have this ecological diversity, uh, which, is, which refers to all the biological interactions between the species and, and between the species and their environments. So it includes biological communities, ecosystems, ecoregions, and, and for example, biosphere, which is the living uh, layer on, on Earth. So with all of these key elements, the biodiversity as a concept may feel a, bit, a, a little bit complicated, but in my opinion, it's a simple concept and it's enough for us, for most of us, and at least for me, it's enough to remember that biodiversity refers to life in all of its different manifestations. So in a way, in my, in my mind, biodiversity is a synonym of life. And, and when we are trying to protect biodiversity, or we are trying to, for example, slow down the biodiversity loss, uh, then we are protecting life. And that's all that needs to be remembered. And how much biodiversity there is, uh, there is a huge amount of biodiversity. At the moment, we estimate that there are about 15 million species on Earth, but we have only discovered and described about 2 million species. So between 80 and 90% of all the species are still undescribed. And that, that makes also the, the conservation of biodiversity a little bit tricky business. And, and it's not so, so easy to, to, to protect biodiversity. And we still need loads of more information to do it uh, efficiently. And unfortunately, at the moment, biodiversity is declining quite, quite rapidly and even collapsing in many areas of the world. So we may estimate, or, or according to the latest estimates, we may be losing like one million species during the next couple of decades. And, and that makes the 
the current situation very difficult and, and quite terrific also. Biodiversity seems to be a very complicated concept and very versatile on the other hand, but uh, maybe many of us feel that uh, biodiversity of species is something familiar to us. Yeah. And now we're trying to battle one particular species fiercely. Mm. So if you were the dictator and could decide, would you preserve the coronavirus? Is all biodiversity favorable? Yeah, you know, uh, let's say that the biodiversity researcher inside of me says that yes, all biodiversity is favorable and, and we should protect all biodiversity. Uh, we have to remember that all biodiversity, all life began about four billions of years ago. So it has a very long history and, and all species in a way are unique and, and they have their roles in nature. So that's, that's important to remember. But of course, at the same time, we have to remember that from the human point of view, if I switch my biodiversity researcher point of view to human point of view, I have to say that no, all biodiversity is not favorable. And, and I, I think that, for example, we, we should get rid of, 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 of coronavirus or Ebola, for example. But, but at the same time, we have to remember and think whether we are the species who can charge whether some species can can exist in the world or or not, that's a very a strong and difficult question to to answer, and and I have to look at it from from these two angles. Uh, at the same time, we have to think that that with diversity normally comes also resilience. So with all the biodiversity, uh, the uh, the na nature will be more. Uh, tolerant to all the environmental challenges that we are causing to nature uh, now and in the future. So in a way, yes, all biodiversity is favorable, but from the human point of view, we have to remember that there are species that are harmful or even dangerous for us. So the question becomes a little bit more complicated. <laughs> Thank you. I can easily relate to your two points of view, because in yeah. ethics, we have the same dilemma. Yeah, it yeah. It has yeah. always been anthropomorphic. We yeah. are human-centered thinkers, but now we realize that we should actually transform our ethical thought to mm. biocentric thought. Yeah, and it's so a we have challenge. these different points of view. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would uh, like to um, welcome Anni Huhtala, Associate Research Professor at BAT, as we say in Finnish, Institute for Economic Research. On the 2nd of February, the UK government launched the Das Gupta Review on the e economics of biodiversity. The review was commissioned by the UK Treasury. The report is voluminous and there have been numerous interpretations of the key message. Uh, the situation reminds me of the philosopher Hegel his texts were quite abstruse, uh, so much so that only one person ever understood them, and he, even he got it all wrong. To make sure that we understand Parta Das Gupta correctly, we have Anni uh, to make sense of the report for non-economists like myself. So Anni, would you say, what uh, is the most important takeaway of the review? Okay, first of all, thanks for inviting me to these discussions and, and interpreting what's the most important message um, is a bit challenging because there are quite many messages in, in, in the review. But basically what it says is that, that our economies are dependent and reliant on nature and all the services and goods that the nature provides for us. And the problem is that we have failed to protect the nature. And that's why we would need to change our view on nature and the way of, of thinking about nature. So we shouldn't see nature as a source of raw material or as a waste sink only. But instead, we should see nature as a valuable asset that is so important for our well-being that, that without nature, we cannot survive. 
And that's why it's kind of basis of economy in a sense. In a similar manner that there are other assets, because for economists at least, it's it's very natural to think about assets as, as a basis for, for our wealth. And the other assets that we normally think about are produced capital, like infrastructure, roads, machines, factories in general, buildings. And on the other hand, human capital, which is our skills and, and knowledge. And then those are valuable assets, produced capital, human capital. And the review says that, that nature should be considered as a valuable asset as well. Then we are properly managing our resources and, and then creating uh, well-being for, for all the people that the economies care about. Thank you. I may be one of those people who has had a hard time to relate to the terms used in the review, like capital. Uh, it makes me think uh, a fetus in the mother's womb who thinks of mother as capital. I must take good care of this asset of mine. <laughs> and the fetus is totally dependent on, on mother, but uh, this little thing still thinks that uh, mother is capital. That, that's the analog that comes to my mind. How would you help me to relate to the terms neutrally so that I, I get adequate uh, representation? Yeah. yeah, I guess that it's uh, because of this economist terminology so that we have certain idea what capital is. But basically because we as economists value capital as an asset so that it's a kind of wealth. So that's why uh, the review tries to convince us that, that just because it's so critical for us, so nature has that feature of capital because the capital is a con concept that takes into account the fact that, that we think about our well-being in the long run. So that, that's why uh, investments in capital are important because without those capital, we cannot really survive basically. So in that sense, the capital, it has a very strong connotations because it's a concept used in, in, in classical economics and everywhere. And then we, we have firm ideas who, who are capitalists. And then, and, but it doesn't take a, a very strong stand on, on, on those kind of uh, uh, perhaps, uh, valuing uh, views on what capital means. It's basically that it's a stock, stock of wealth. And if you think in that way, so it's much more neutral complex, uh, concept, and, and, and then you can understand that uh, the, the idea is uh, to value nature, not that, that it would be just something that, that we don't care about. Uh, just because it doesn't necessarily have the price that, uh, for example, market uh, goods have. But those ecosystem services are still valuable. And, and in, in that con uh, context, so, so it's kind of uh, different kind of uh, services that capital provides. Thank you very much. I very much sympathize with your view. I'll try to educate myself on this. Term now. Uh, next, I'll welcome uh, Markus Granlund, Professor of Management, Accounting and Control Systems, and the Dean of Turku School of Economics at the University of Turku. Markus, so far we've been talking about the need for change in economics. What about the next steps of implementing change in different sectors of society? there seem to be many conflicting interests that need to be rec reconciled. Well, thank you uh, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a really um, uh, uh, my great pleasure and honor to, to be invited here among the experts. Well, um, well, you didn't start with the easiest question, <laughs> I guess. Uh, um, 
this this question is um, it's not easy, even medium easy. And 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 I, I guess if we knew all the things that we should do, we we would have already done quite a bit, at least at least much more than we have so far. So all, all the wicked problems are, are by their nature, as the, as the name says, wicked. So really, really, really difficult. And, and uh, wicked problems also refers to um, uh, problems where there may not even be solutions or the solutions will be very painful for at least um, many of us. Uh, but that, of course, shouldn't hinder us from trying. Uh, anyway, wh whenever we discuss the need for systemic transformation, as I see this is something that we need, that there are so many voices, as you know, and, and, and they are contradictory to, to a large extent. Uh, though there is one party that doesn't have a voice, and that is the nature. And, and if we people, men, if we are not speaking for biodiversity, for instance, then, then you know, who will? So in a way, I, I think all this should eventually come from inside of us. It should be something we want, something we want to be proud of, i.e. to save biodiversity and, and the planet. And as Ilari aptly said that, we save life. And, and so it, it, it can't go always so that we just control at taxes and, and, and fines, uh, but, but we, we need more, even more kind of genuine awareness and dis uh, discussion on the forms of, of systemic transformation and the, and the tools we might have. And, and at the same time, we have to think of what each of us is ready to give up, whether it's us as individual or as owners of companies and so, or as politicians or, or so forth and, and so forth. So this is like strategy making in my view. Uh, uh, it is about choices, what we want to be in the future and especially what not. And the not is always the hard question and, and, a, and a choice to be made. Thank you. Since Marcus is the Dean at TSE, it means that from time to time, quite regularly, he sends encouraging emails to the whole personnel. And I've come to realize that, that the basic uh, mood is very optimistic, or then it's official optimism. But, but I got the impression that you really believe in people's capacities to change. Yes. And especially show if, when, I, when I look at our students and, they, and, they, and even younger people, youngsters and, and, and children even. Uh, I, anyway, I, yeah, I, I remain positive, but of course there is so much at stake politically and, and economically. But anyway, uh, from, from, from the business school perspective, um, I, I think, and there is actually global discussion among uh, business school, uh, different kinds of, of communities about the kind of special role of business schools in creating a better a better future, uh, naturally together with other disciplines, and 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 this is happening already as we have moved towards a, a platform type of, of collaboration increasingly, and and I think it is yet business schools among some others, from where many corporate leaders graduate, and and there, thereby we, I feel that we have special kind of responsibility. Of, of considering what we teach to our um, students and, and our research at agendas and, and curricula have already changed to, to address sustainability issues deeply and widely. And, and it's, it is good in, in my view that, that also the funding parties also drive this development regarding research 
and 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 I, I just recently calculated that we have uh, more than 30 courses addressing responsibility issues alone, including business ethics and re related issues. And, and, and the encouraging observation really is that if, you know, if we didn't offer all this, our, our students would demand it. And, and in a course where it, it, it's led by Dr. Julia Räikkönen, where we were there together with Ilari lecturing on economics uh, um, and, and biodiversity. And, and, and we learned that the students uh, had given feedback that, that do they, for instance, do, do they need to just wait for a new generation of corporate leaders that would consider sustainability, biodiversity uh, issues in general uh, uh, seriously enough already at the outset. Thank you, Markus. Talking about corporate leaders, we have one on board. Uh, Ilka Herlin is chairman of the board of uh, Cargotech Corporation, and he also holds a PhD in history. Recently, there has been a lot of discussion on the relevance of humanistic studies in business, lead business leadership. So Ilka's situation is a case in point. Welcome to the discussion. Uh, you have a long practical experience in promoting sustainability. For example, as the co-founder and board member of Baltic Sea Action Group Foundation. Based on your experience, what kind of measures should we take to enhance biodiversity? First of all, good afternoon and thanks for the invitation. What kind of measures should we take for biodiversity? Um, first, we should remember that it, it, biodiversity is the same as, as the life on Earth as, and beneath the land as well, as Ilari said. That's the most, most important thing to re remember. Uh, secondly, we should remember that uh, we have quite a many wicked problems right now going on and they are they are connected each each other for example biodiversity is directly connected to, to climate change the more we we decrease biodiversity in the soil for example and the vegetation the more we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and then when we try to sequester carbon from the atmosphere into the soil, we protect uh, biodiversity at the same time. So I would say that that's the most important thing to remember that we are not in this kind of a situation. We are not, if we would try to uh, stop the climate change, it's not really enough to discuss about uh, fossil fuels or something, something like that. We should really see the problems as a whole and try to find the solutions by that way. Giving any exact measure for that is, a, of course, <laughs> it's a huge challenge, but we should start there, what I described. In your work, you've also created uh, relations between states, businesses, and civil society. Uh, that is absolutely necessary, but can you give some practical uh, advice how to do it? Exactly. As repeating that, that those wicked problems, they are, so, they are so huge that simply we need all hands on the deck. We need, we need the business area to make the innovations, we need the science, make the inventions, we need civil uh, we have consumers for, for, for making choices and most and the most important we have democratic government which should which should rule what kind of a society we are living in and th by that way give like a stick and carrot to the business and one of the, to the con consumers as well to protect our world from this changing and huge threats we are facing. Thank you, Ilka. 
going back to this uh, division of human and, and research perspective, I would like to ask Ilari, now that we are still in the middle of the pandemia, is there a connection between human health and biodiversity? Now that we emphasize the human point of view. Yeah, there certainly is a connection or connections in, in many ways. Uh, of course, first, we it's good to remember that, that biodiversity provides us with food, with, with air to breathe, with, with clean water to drink. And that's a health, health issue also and, and a well-being issue for us. So that's the kind of one way how biodiversity affects our health in many ways. And then we all know, for example, after this uh, seminar, I will, I will go, go to have a long walk in the forest with my family and with my dog. And, and uh, I will, during that walk, I will forget all the meetings that I have had today and, and I will repress myself. So it's very good for our mental health and, and, and biodiversity affects our well-being in, and health. In, in that way also. And of course, what comes to the pandemia, uh, we have to remember that, that all the pandemics, or at least most of the pandemics, they emerge from the microbe reservoirs uh, present in, in nature. And at the moment, when we are changing the environment so rapidly, we are kind of invading areas that, that we haven't invaded before, and we are putting us into more and more contact with wild wildlife, uh, that means that also the possibility of, of new virus transmissions, for example, is increasing uh, all the time. And, and uh, it is quite terrible to, to think, or quite frightening to think that, that according to the latest estimates, uh, there might be even hundreds of thousands of, for example, viruses in nature that can have the ability to infect also uh, people or our livestock and and a certain percentage of those are capable of causing pandemics also so at the same time when we are destroying nature and when we are interfering uh, with biodiversity in 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 destructing biodiversity we are also increasing uh, the risk of future pandemics and and in my opinion that's quite uh, frightening at the same time, of course, we have to remember that that uh, biodiversity also provides us with, with future pharmaceuticals, for example. So it's a source of possibilities also uh, from the point of view of human human health. And and what comes to the current pandemic, I have tried to find also positive things about it. And please do not understand me wrong in a wrong way. Uh, I know that hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives. And for example, my wife is, is a Peruvian. So we have been monitoring uh, quite carefully the situation of Latin America all the time. And last week, I, I just asked from my wife uh, how many of her friends and family members have been infected or even died, diseased uh, because of COVID-19 COVID disease. And, and she said that about one quarter, so about 25% about of her friends and, and family members have been uh, infected with the, with the coronavirus. So the situation is, is very, very difficult and, and it's very severe. But at the same time, I have tried to, to find these positive things about the pandemic. And one is, of course, it has boosted science. So we have all seen that, that uh, all the research team have been able to, to develop new vaccines, for example, uh, very rapidly. So it, in a way it has boosted science. It has also unified humankind. Uh, for one year at least we have had one enemy in common and, and, and that's in my opinion it has been good for the humankind. But the third thing that uh, is related to biodiversity is that I, I think that this pandemic, this corona pandemic could be one of those turning points which show to people that we have to behave well with biodiversity, that actually biodiversity is protecting us uh, and, and, and it's good to protect biodiversity in order to decrease the risk of, of future, future pandemics. Uh, about the beneficial aspects, I have recently tried to adjust my diet so that the yeah. microbiome in my gut would be happy 
Uh, all yeah, kinds yeah. of good things happen to a human being when the microbiome is in good shape. And if yeah. there is no biodiversity in nature around us, how could we have the biodiversity necessary for us in the gut, for example, mm, elsewhere mm, in the mm. human body? So in that respect, we are directly dependent on... Bio. Yeah, yeah. It's like that. And uh, we can talk about the, the so-called biodiversity hypothesis, which means that we have our microbiome, the diversity of all the micro microbes inside of our guts, and also on the outer layer of our skin, we have the human microbiome, but then we have this environmental microbiome, which is interacting with our microbiome all the time. So in a way, it is kind of enriching if we are in contact with natural environments, the environmental microbiome is, is kind of enriching the, the human uh, microbiome. And, and it's also boosting our, our immune system. So we will be healthier in the, in, the, in the future. And it is for that reason, for example, here in Finland, we think that it's good for, for children to, to play, play in nature and, and have a real contact with nature. It's good for their health. So biodiversity, in many ways, it is connected with, with the human health. And, and that's a very important point to, to remember that in a way, biodiversity is, is protecting our health. But if we continue destructing nature and biodiversity, then it can also cause us very difficult problems in the future. So if, if we keep, keep destructing nature and, and if we keep, keep on with the biodiversity loss, uh, then we will see more and more pandemics in the future. Thank you. Anni, in this series of webinars, we're talking about global goodness, the possibility of sharing uh, global core values. From the point of view of the Das Gupta report, should we deal with biodiversity issues globally or locally or both of them? Uh, we should deal with uh, biodiversity problems both globally and locally. And basically, the review establishes uh, that we are dealing with an institutional failure. So it's not kind of a failure in, 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 in pricing uh, environmental services and goods, but it's the institutions that have failed. And that means that, that that's why we haven't been able to protect the global uh, public goods, such like the oceans or the world's rainforests. And, and do some kind of remedy for that problem, the review proposes that, that we should have a kind of uh, supranational body that make sure that, that we protect those global public goods together and perhaps institutionalize payments for ecosystem services that are important for all of us, independent where on the globe they are. But then also we have uh, local uh, challenges with the declining biodiversity. And for that purpose, we need local expertise. And, and as an economist, it's very natural to think about those land use changes that, that are carried out for, for economic development. And then before we are going to make those investments, so we should carefully carry out kind of social cost benefit analysis where we also take into account uh, those impacts on biodiversity. So uh, both globally and locally. And then the challenge is that, that um, our institutions are, uh, are not so far dealing with uh, these common problems related to these public goods. Thank you, very good. Uh, Markus, uh, as the Dean of a Business School, you have a strong orientation towards the future. You already outlined many of those things that business schools and Turku School of Economics especially is doing, but is there something you would do, like to add concerning the future possibilities and the role of business schools? 
Well, if I one thing I had in mind, if I take a look at the at the, at the business sector, so I'm so I, I what I said about the business school is there's not much to add at this point, but but I think what what uh, corporations can do, and I, I I think well Ilka obviously has many great examples of of what businesses can do. And, and it goes hand in hand with the long-term uh, value creation of, uh, of, of the firm value as well. Uh, as we know, the SDGs and, and all these are being uh, followed increasingly and, and many of the funds are becoming, you know, we increasingly talk about responsible fu uh, funds and, and so forth. But, but then there are these things that individual companies can do also in their in their um, daily operations. I found it very interesting in the recent issue of Talouselämä magazine, there was a case story of, of a com company called Rudus. Many of you may know that because they, they are heavily committed to biodiversity and, and, and conservation. And, and when, whenever, you know, their, their actions have quite a bit of effect on land and land use. But before they start any, any actions there, they always have a very careful conservation plan. And, and, and then after, after the actions they do, they, uh, they uh, conservate, but they do also more kind of extra. They don't leave it there. They may build in other places, for instance, ponds for frogs or whatever. So, so all kinds of things can be done to protect and, 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 and uh, restore biodiversity in, in areas. So I, I think the, that's a great idea. And, and if, if all companies that, for instance, have a lot of effect on, on land use and, and land, we have examples that this can be done. And it's part of the normal part of the business. That's very inspiring. Thank you. Ilka, for some reason, we're talking about the different fields of sustainability separately. There has been a discussion on climate change, and now we are talking about biodiversity. But in your work to enhance sustainability, you've seen the interconnected of all the fields of sustainability. Could you please uh, talk a little bit about that? Uh, right. As Ilari mentioned, uh, the, and you asked, so that the pandemic, they are, they are as well connected to the biodiversity very closely. And biodiversity is connected to climate change and vice versa. So I really see the huge problems we have in the global world, where they are all connected into each other. And, and in that sense, uh, what Marcos said about businesses, uh, Businesses are very good at for in innovating, but not in the, uh, not like what people believe that it would be these uh, market forces who can save us from whatever. But simply, the, it doesn't go so. There aren't any market forces who, which would autonomously do something good. No, we we, we need the government. We need the pub public power for that. And now, now that when when. The public power gives the restrictions to the businesses. They start innovating and are very good at that. And that is really the strengths we have in, in uh, societies. And that we should really remember. And, and we should really show the way here in, in countries like Finland, where, where, where we have got quite a good uh, societies working quite well better than I could say anywhere else. We don't, don't have any, not much corruption or things like that, or criminality uh, and so on. So we, we should, that, that's what we could really do here in Finland, show the way how to do it together. And that's the way, because we simply, uh, as I said earlier, we simply need all hands on the deck if we want to tackle these problems somehow. I'm a little bit, at the same side as Marcus, that this situation is quite, it's critical, but we have to try to do the, the best out of it, what we can, so we simply can't lose our hope. 
but this is the way I, I see the things happening and what is really important as a historian I would like to say that the whole problem comes from that the, the, we have the, especially the western cultural culture we have this uh, misunderstanding that there would be something which autonomously drives us into progress no I don't see there anything we are not the lords of the all creation there is no invi invisible hand there is no technology which which would produce uh, good solutions by themselves no we have to simply analyze the situation better and see each and every scientific invention and innovation as a part of the whole system and start simply uh, or uh, that should be always part of the scientific work to see how how the solutions work when it's connected to the wholeness there's a good example is, is this economics where uh, where this phrase externality or externalities latest by now they are taken seriously but in the mainstream economics there is no space for for externalities in the day-to-day -day business so that that that's a good example where we really should make a change and fast I don't know what Anne thinks about this, but she should, should be kind of a, an expert there here. May I comment on that directly? Please. So uh, this externalities, that's a concept that, that economists have launched just to understand why markets can fail. So that, that when we do not have market prices for ecosystem services, so we cannot come to an efficient solution of resource allocation that economists are worried about, so that we are investing in wrong things. And then the externality per se doesn't mean that it would be something um, uh, negative. It's just that, that because it is external in, in our uh, daily decision making, that's why we ignore it. And then that's why uh, uh, as you say, we do not see this externality in, in, in when we are making decisions, whether we make uh, or think that we make profitable investments or, or we just choose different products when, when we go to groceries. So, so basically, that's the uh, fundamental problem when you have public goods like environmental goods. True, yeah. I have to say that I knew uh, Olavi, Professor Niitamo uh, at the 1970s, and he told me that actually this, this and he was an econo economist, and he said that actually this is going all wrong because the economics doesn't they at all take into account things like that, like environment or, <laughs> or this kind of a, uh, thinking. And it was in 1970s and it made a huge impact to me. And, and now, now finally we are taking this thing seriously. Okay, and of course that's, that's positive. And I, we can change, we can change our thinking and change ways we act especially with when we talk about biodiversity and nature as a whole. That's all so true. there are positive things as well. That's all very interesting. Ilka says that we're not the lords and masters of the universe and, and, and he emphasizes that we should take into account nature in a new way. So I would like to hear all from all of you uh, something that is related to my own field. So I let you uh, solve my personal problems for me. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Does nature have intrinsic value or instrumental value only? If if you think that nature has intrinsic value, then it would like I would like to hear how you came to that conclusion. Anybody? I definitely think that nature has intrinsic value, and then I guess that that. Uh, the problem is that, that I'm not a philosopher, so I don't know uh, what it means when, when 
I, I, I consider things from human point of view, and it's very difficult for me that, that how we could be biocentered on behalf of nature, because then all our social cost benefit analysis would be gone, because they are for human beings, those calculations, even if we would care for nature, so still we, we would do it for our purposes. But on the other hand, I guess that that's some kind of sign of that, that we care for nature is those natural parks we have established. Because people are not allowed to enter there, not only for research purposes. And I guess that that's a kind of one kind of manifestation that, that uh, we still think that, that, that nature has intrinsic value. They are there, even though most of us can go in there, for example. Yes, thank well, you. My answer is that nature, of course, has the in intrinsic value, but the pragmatic value as well. That now the day when we uh, confess that we are part of nature and not the lord of the nature, so it starts from that day. Uh, actually, the Western culture is the first one who has been, which has been thinking that we are something different from the nature. The other culture has has not made have not made that. Uh, mistake. Now that if we change our thinking, it may cause that, as Das Gupta describes the system, I'm not an economist, but I try to interpret him. So he has this uh, uh, produced capital, human capital, and then natural capital. Then if we change our thinking that we are part of nature, so that might cause uh, so that, that phenomenon of stranded capital in both in uh, produced capital, but as well in human capital. So this, that kind of thinking, which only takes into account the social system or technological system, they are not. They are always. Uh, they are not taking the full full system into account. So we always need the nature in our thinking. Otherwise, we will fail, uh, fail and fail constantly, again and again. So that's that's may, maybe the basic. Thing, what's uh, what we should really do and develop the dust up the review to the next level, so to say. Ilka, uh, you're critical of the Western culture. Uh, do you recall what Mahatma Gandhi answered when he was asked, what do you think about the Western culture? Do you happen to know the story? Uh, he answered, I I, he answered, you help me. He answered I think it would be a great idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are. You know, we are on the right path right now. <laughs> I hope so. Markus, what do you think about nature's intrinsic value? Well, um, my my own human nature relation or, or experience starts actually. Every single morning as I go to the nearby forest with my dogs, and it, it simply has a deep effect on my mind and, and, and well-being. And I have always thought that the nature of the forest just needs to be there. It doesn't need to serve any purpose. It just simply makes me happy to watch, you know, the birds and, and ants and how the ecosystem works, mm -hmm. because that is that is a necessity also for our very existence, as Ilari pointed in the beginning. And of course, the sad thing for me is that the municipality intends to cut the forest down as it sees their, their only land for roads and, 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 and uh, uh, buildings. But uh, for me, nature definitely has intrinsic value. And I, I truly support what, what uh, Ilka said, that we, we have come a long way from from a too long way from the from the earlier ideas so so that now man comes always first but there there is a long history for that and, and it's time to change the history and um, and one more thing uh going back to what Ilka said earlier so he saved actually me because it is so i i truly support the view that it's not only about companies and businesses, but also 
the government, the public sector, everything, environmental laws, they all have to be up to date and in place so that there is both carrot and stick also for businesses. And when we need, unfortunately, we need careful control of, of course, of all the environmental acts. Mm -hmm. And now over to Ilari, I guess. Yeah, yeah I maybe also- you can, Maybe you can surprise us now, totally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also think that nature has, and biodiversity has intrinsic value. And, and in my opinion, again, as a biodiversity researcher and as a, as a, as a biologist who studies also the evolution of species, for me, intrinsic value comes from the extremely long evolutionary history of, of biodiversity. So as I said in my earlier answer, uh, life began about four billion years ago. So, so it has been developing and evolving for a long time. And, and all the species that we see today and all the biodiversity that we see today is a, is a kind of... Uh, uh, is a kind of point of that continuum that we that has been evolving such a long time and all species are unique they have their roles in nature uh, they might not be useful for us but they have the roles in in nature and from for me the intrinsic value comes from from that 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 point and when we are now losing those species or other components of biodiversity we are in a way cutting off the branches of the tree of life and that makes me really sad because although somebody thinks that we can, uh, got, uh, we can get those species back in the future by using some, some extraterrestrial <laughs> technologies, uh, we will lose those species forever. And at the same time, when we are losing biodiversity, when we are losing those species, we are losing evolutionary stories of four billion year, billions, billion years. So, so that's, that's the main reason why I think that all biodiversity has intrinsic value also. And uh, I think that it's a long way to enter from kind of anthropocentric point of view to biocentric point of view. But as uh, I remember reading one interview of Edwardo Wilson, of Professor Edwardo Wilson, who is a kind of father of biodiversity research, uh, he said some 20 years ago that there is one good thing in, in humankind, and that is that we like challenges. And I think that that is a huge challenge that we, we are trying to, to move from the anthropocentric point of view to biocentric point of view. But it can be done, but it will take time. And we have to be, we have to be kind of realistic. We, we cannot e expect some results very soon. It will take time. But I, I think that's the way that we should uh, we should go in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Now we finally have some comments uh, via chat. Habib Yahia says, I would think a way to improve on the sustainability performance of all parties, individuals, companies and government is to gradually decipher the externalities continuously by way of continuous awareness and research. And Timo Huttunen comments, uh, current shortage of ICs uh, slowing down certain sectors in economy is a super example of interconnectedness, but might not be a crisis big enough for stakeholders to realize the importance of understanding externalities. So that's the response that we have received so far. Uh, now you can comment uh, each other. There are certainly some ideas that uh, have remained in the bubble be 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 beside your heads. I would like to comment those uh, comments so that at least that one that that it's very important this awareness so that that because it's related what Ilka said earlier that that uh, because markets fail, we need environmental regulation and, and, and policymakers to intervene. And then they only do it, policymakers, I mean, if there is awareness among citizens and they demand that, that there got to be changed. And then that promotes the 
um, innovation capacities of their firms and also citizens who are working in those firms. So that 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 I think that that we shouldn't think about companies like. Uh, entities that are kind of black box that they they would have a certain mind of thinking but there are people working in those companies and and then they are desperate in struggling in 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 the tough competition but if we are living in a world where, where it's good to be good for environment and nature then these companies are driving for that so it's what we basically as citizens demand Exactly. Exactly. We should. We should. The companies, the people there who make the companies, they. We should have that kind of system that they can really be proud of, what they are doing for biodiversity and so forth. As I said earlier. Okay. Maybe we should now apply Tolstoy's rule. Tolstoy taught that those things you say first and those things you say last will remain with the audience forever. So now it's the time for a, a very short uh, statement that you want your, your audience to remember on their deathbeds. Hmm. Or remember tomorrow. Yeah, I could actually start by saying that that remember always to be positive. I think that we have most of the tools that we need for conserving biodiversity. And now we just have to make international decisions and, and decide together that we are going to that direction. So, so let's try to be positive and, and but realistic at the, at the same time. That's important. And, and one thing about Das Gupta report, I would like to remind all of you that please read that report and, 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 and let's hope that it will not be for, for, forgotten uh, very soon. So it's very important to, to keep it in the surface all the time. <laughs> Thank you. And Anne. Among other things, Daskupta says that nature is oftentimes silent and invisible. So that's why it's very important to uh, increase our awareness because if we cannot see and smell things so it's easy to forget them so that's where the institutional change comes from if we are aware of biodiversity and now i have a task for marcus instead of your independent statement you are guided by the chat any ideas on how we can make people more aware on how their consumption decisions affect biodiversity? Mm. Well, I, I think it's, it's simply through re, uh, high quality research and, and that kind of research is being made also in the University of Turku, but also widely nationally and, 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 and globally. And awareness here is the key as so many of Anni just said it again. Awareness is, is, is the key, but of course, um, uh, the system also needs to be in place, as said by Ilkka and, 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 um, and others. Yet I, I want to conclude my, my thoughts with the, with the idea why I like Ilari's idea that we, we should still be optimistic. And I'm optimistic for the reason, as I said already, that I see uh, uh, a great deal of different kind of awareness in our students and the youngsters. So they will, of course, they will be the future decision makers. Yet I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the thing that we should um, be able to speed up the developments now a lot, considering what's happening at the very moment, for instance, in, in Amazonia and, and so forth. So good things and worries. Thank you. I'm sure Riku Santala is happy with your answer. That was his question. And now, Ilka, you have the concluding words. Okay, the Gandhi was mentioned here. So I would like to mention Konfutse who said that the plant 
a tree every day, I would say. So plant at least one tree every day and be sure that you are not building monocultures, but diversified cultures into the, into the nature. Thank you. Rick, Rick replies that he's very happy indeed. And so am I. I'm very happy uh, with your presence here and your great contribution. So, so warm thanks to our excellent panelists. And Thank warm you. thanks to our technical team, uh, Laura and Terhikki. And um, now uh, I, I would like us to orientate towards the future we will have our next discussion on the values of foreign policy. Hope to see you all then. And as uh, Marcus and Ilari has encouraged, have encouraged us, let us enjoy the spring in the forest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.